In this week's video, I'm finally going to be testing my brand new Bison trimming tools. I should add a preface to this video, as in no way is it sponsored or an advert. I'm simply a potter who loves to trim, and I finally got my hands on some legendary tools made by Phil Bison himself. I bought four quite different shapes, and it's worth noting that for each of these tools, Phil hand turns the handle so that it fits your hand exactly, and when given the option, I went with the carving handle type as is simply the type of handle that I'm used to using. I'm especially excited about this smaller one. The blades of these are all made from tungsten carbide, so while they are incredibly strong and sharp, they're also very brittle, so if they were to fall on a hard floor, there's a chance the blade could shatter and break, which is why, as per Phil's recommendation, I've built them a special box to store them in when I'm using them, but I'll show you that later. I went with four very different blade types to do different jobs, and this is probably the most unusual. I'm pretty sure I'll use this one just to remove mass rather than do any shaping, but we'll see I guess. Perhaps I'll find a good use for it. And the last one is a simple straight edge, which I guess is a lot of my pots are so straight and simple, this will come in really handy. These tools arrived just as I was coming to the end of a long making cycle, so they've been sat in their boxes, waiting, and I've been so, so excited to use them and I thought what better way than testing them than with bowls. But first, here's their special little box, which is quite literally thick cardboard with foam and sellotape to hold it all together. Like I said previously, and as Phil warns, the blades of these really are fragile, so making some kind of container that they can be placed in so they won't roll off the table is really important. You'll also notice in the middle here a little potter's needle. This is a bison tool I've had for a while now, and it was given to me by Jono Smart, a friend and a great potter who you should definitely check out. Anyhow, there's no throwing in this video. It's quite literally going to be 20 minutes of trimming with my comments on the tools and some tips and tricks for trimming along the way too. I'll start by turning my medium bowls, which are thrown from approximately one pound of stoneware clay and have a foot ring that measures six centimeters across. I thought it might be interesting to weigh the bowls before and after they've been trimmed to give you a good idea of just how much material I turn away. So this is just about 400 grams now, as it's lost some of its water weight and some clay that came off my hands and tools as I was throwing it. These pieces are just on the firmer side of leather hard, which is the perfect condition to trim in, in my opinion, and I really do make sure they're properly dry, as if the internal clay on these bowls is still quite soft. The pieces might deform as you attach the clay around the rim here to secure it in place, and even the act of trimming can squash or misshape your bowl if it's too soft. I then take my measured calipers and a sharp potter's needle and I score a circle into the base of the bowl. This marks my foot ring's external diameter and it ensures that the foot rings are identical to one another. And finally, I can start to trim. As you can see, they're really sharp. I almost have to restrain myself as I trim, as not to turn straight through the bowl itself. The sharp blade bites wonderfully, and it really does almost pull you in as the sharp tungsten carbide digs into the stoneware clay. Once I've trimmed my scored line, I'll switch to this finer tool to do some more detailed work, such as trimming inward like so to define the actual foot. And again, this razor sharp tool just cuts right through the clay. I then push and trim downward removing more mass as I go. When I throw these bowls, I purposefully leave about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half in the base. That way there's plenty of clay to expose a nice tall foot ring from. Once the walls of the bowl have been trimmed, I can begin to shape the actual foot. This is when I trim in these two facets. The topmost will remain unglazed and it'll be where I stamp my maker's mark and the groove created by the other one acts as a glaze catch. So my glazes pull into that band rather than spilling over onto the kiln shelves. Then I can begin to remove clay from the inside of the foot ring. And for this process, I found that my old tools still worked best. This little loop tool might not be the sharpest, but there's something about its shape and the angle at which I can use it. It really lets me trim out a lot of material very easily while also maintaining a lot of control. And control and stability are really the keys to trimming well. After all, it only takes one wrong movement to ruin the piece. So during this entire process, I'm always touching both my hands together 
like you can see here, my right hand is resting on my left hand as I trim, which creates stability. I also tend to lean down onto my arms, using my upper body weight to help stabilise them as I trim. For me, personally, it's a very mechanical process, as compared to when throwing with fresh, soft clay. Once the foot's more or less finished, I stamp it with my maker's mark. This does displace a tiny amount of clay upward, so I just trim this portion of the foot to make sure it's nice and level once again. And that's it for one bowl. It can be removed and set aside with the others to dry out bone dry before they can be biscuit fired. But first, let's weigh it again, just to see how much clay was removed during the trimming process, which ends up being about 219 grams removed. Bowls really are very light at this stage. For this next bowl, I'll be using this hook shaped tool, as I think its sharp corner should be really good at removing quite a lot of clay at once. I'm sure any potter watching will know just how much fun I'm having. There's nothing quite like trimming with brand new, very sharp tools, although it really does take some getting used to. And with this particular bowl, I do end up trimming away just a bit too much, resulting in its demise, and a useful cross-section too. But you'll see that in a moment. In fact, you can see the exact moment I realise I've trimmed slightly too far. I think generally, as I've thrown and trimmed thousands of these at this point, I tend to go wrong when the internal form is thrown incorrectly. It's not so much that I've trimmed too much away, it's just that I've thrown that particular bowl with the thinness in the wrong part. So while the walls here are pretty inconsistent, the actual footering portion of the bowl is more or less perfect. So this should give you a pretty good idea of what I'm aiming for, despite the very thin section in the walls. Really, what I'm aiming for is an even thickness throughout the entire bowl, with walls that perhaps get a little bit finer as they reach the rim. Anyhow, this piece will be dried out bone dry and then thrown into my reclaim bucket, where it'll turn into a sludge that I can eventually recycle and throw into new pots. I'm often asked whether I trim the rims of the bowls, and generally speaking I don't. Ideally they're thrown to the correct thickness and won't need any trimming whatsoever. The final tool I'll be testing out at the beginning to remove most of the clay is the Robustus, and I can tell you already that this is my favourite amongst the three larger tools, and since filming this it's already trimmed through several hundred pots. It's just really versatile. It has the sharp corner that I like, the flat section of the blade, and the larger looped portion, each part being distinctly useful in their own way during this beginning process. Although during this first day of trimming, I really was just switching between them, just to get used to them as best I could. There are pros and cons to using sharp tools. It can almost be more difficult to wield, especially if you're new to trimming. Additionally, if you aren't careful, it's very easy to leave a chattering mark on the outside of the form, which is sometimes unavoidable, so I just remove the faint chattering marks later on with a flat metal kidney. But what they do well is remove clay, obviously, but they do so in such a manner that you don't have to apply much downward pressure onto the pot you're trimming. This means if you're trimming quite thin pots, like I do, there's less of a chance of the piece deforming slightly or changing shape as it might if you were using slightly blunt trimming tools, which you would then have to apply a lot more pressure with to trim in a similar kind of way. But I love these tools already, and I can't wait until the shop goes live again so I can buy a few more. When I'm trimming the inside of a foot ring, really my aim is to bring it down to the same level as the curved walls outside of the foot ring. You want to imagine it like so. If you were to remove the foot ring itself, you'd be left with a nice continuous curve, not a form that perhaps had a dip or a raise in the middle, but is simply one continuous curve. And this does sometimes mean that I do do a little bit of correction on the outside after I've trimmed the internal foot ring, just to bring them to the same level. I then push in my maker's mark, and notice how I keep a finger behind it as I do so, brace the foot ring so it isn't deformed by the pressure of pushing it in. I then trim the very bottom level, and this also removes any wiring off marks which I don't want to keep. And then I do some final burnishing, just with my fingertips, just to smooth over what might be very sharp edges. I then peel back the lugs of clay that firmly hold the bowl in place, and double check the interior form. I use this mirror a lot when trimming. It lets me see the side view of the piece I'm working on. 
and it allows me to see if the curves and footering are correct. Otherwise, without the mirror, I only have a bird's eye view of the form. It's providing you with so much more information, which is why I can't throw or trim without one really. Well, I can of course, but I feel as if I'm missing a sense almost. And here's a side-by-side -side comparison, showing both trimmed bowls and those still waiting for their turn. I think the days spent trimming, bowl after bowl, are probably my favourite. I think from the outside it can look like an awful lot of repetition, and it certainly is, but I relish it. I adore the process of trimming away clay, defining the shape, perfecting my movements, and finding which parts of the tool are best for which job. By the following morning, these bowls will be bone dry already, and for the most part I tend to dry them out on their rims, like so. These are now the two pound versions of the same bowl. They're thrown with twice the weight, and are lifted off the wheel head without a bat, which is why now, the following morning, I flip them all over onto their rims, onto larger bats, so that the bottoms can dry out properly. This can take a couple of hours, depending on the weather. Once they're really leather hard, I place them back onto a board, and I'll move them all together back over to my wheel to begin trimming. After these bowls, I'll also be trimming the half pound versions, which are much smaller, to eventually create a set of bowls that nestle into one another. When I push on these lugs of clay, I'm really not pushing them into the bowl itself. Instead I'm pushing them straight down into the metal wheel head and the clay that displaces and pushes gently against the bowl is usually enough to hold it really firmly in place. In combination with the lugs of clay, my left hand here is also doing quite a lot of work. Throughout this beginning stage, it's constantly pushing quite firmly downward, pinning the bowl against the wheel head, as there is always the chance that the tool will catch and as it does so, it tends to leap upward. So my left hand is not only helping to keep the bowl pinned down, but it's also there to catch it if it leaps up. The way you hold your trimming tool is also very important too. You'll notice in most of these clips that my fingertips are almost always as close to the end of the tool as I can possibly get them. By being here, it means I can apply far more pressure into the bowl itself thus removing more clay, but perhaps more importantly, it also helps me to control the tool with far more ease. This is compared to say, if you are holding the tool on the far end of the handle, which makes the tool almost useless, as you simply can't apply enough pressure to trim firmly, and instead you end up following all the undulations and wobbles that might be in the bowl itself. Even if they're only minuscule, the more you trim like this, the more you end up exaggerating them, and the worse they get. This is what I do if I do want to remove some very light chattering. I take a sharp metal kidney, bend it slightly and hold it against the form of the bowl. And once the outer walls are done, I can begin to trim the foot ring itself, again creating those two important facets. And as you can see, I'm using one of my old tools again. This isn't one of my bison tools, in fact I have no idea where I got it from, I've had it that long. But it's very fine and very delicate, and sharp too good for doing those little details. When I'm trimming the interior foot, I like to set my inner boundary like this first. Then I can go back and start to remove more of the mass from inside the middle of the foot ring itself. But by having this set boundary, I know that I shouldn't trim past that point. I then gradually remove the clay, layer by layer. And I really do try not to bite off more than I can chew, as if I try to remove a huge amount of clay in one go it tends to become very difficult to control. And throughout this entire process, it's very easy to poke a hole just straight through the bottom. You may see potters tapping the undersides of their pots like this occasionally too. A low thud means that it's quite thick, and a higher pitch noise means that it's thinner. Of course, the tone changes when you're making different sized pots all the time, but after making hundreds and thousands of these shapes, you can get quite a good idea of what's going on just with a simple tap. And if that fails, I just push on it ever so carefully with my thumb. And if I feel it give, even just a little bit, I know that it's time to stop. 
I then use the back end of this metal knife just to scrape over my trimming marks and to make the base nice and flat. And finally, I push in my maker's mark, again bracing the other side of where the mark goes with a finger. The smallest of my four new bison tools is very good for this process. And again lastly, just a quick burnish with my fingertips, and then I can lift the piece away. I've saved the smallest bowl for last, stacked up like so and wrapped up in plastic over the weekend, so they don't dry out too much. There's nothing worse than throwing a big batch of pots, only for them all to get too dry, and thus unusable. So I wrapped these up really tightly over the weekend, so that no drafts could get to them, as that's what really dries pots out quickly. These smaller bowls are obviously much faster to trim in comparison to the other two, but they are also much more of a fiddle, as their trimmed feet are really quite fine and dainty almost. Here, all I'm doing is running my hands over the bases of the bowls and trying to find those that are the driest amongst them. These are the pieces I'll start with, and I'll let those that are slightly damper dry out for a bit longer. So at the end of the day, Trimming is all about catching the clay at that perfect moment, when it isn't too firm or too soft, and really being able to identify when pots are at this perfect stage is a skill in itself, but the more you make pots, the easier it is to identify. The feet of these measure four and a half centimeters across, compared to the larger bowls, which are eight and a half, and the medium bowls, that are six. These smaller ones are thrown from half a pound of clay, or 226 grams, and once trimmed, they're less than half of that usually. In this instance, the rim section was a little thick, so I just trimmed it before I attached the lugs to hold it in place. I then take my set calipers and a sharp potter's needle and score in the outer diameter of my foot ring. And for these, I find the loop section of the robustus tool to be really good. And you may notice, in some instances, that I end up using my left hand's fingers to help control the blade. I then gouge away material near the top to reveal the foot ring, and then trim below, just to neaten up that angle. For these small bowls, I have to use a really tiny trimming tool to trim in these facets. Again, this isn't one of my bison trimming tools. It's an older one, and another one that I'm not really sure where I obtained it, but I'm pretty sure most pottery supplies will sell more or less the same thing. Once the outer form is finished, I can then begin to remove material from inside the foot ring, and this is all fingertip work really. It can sometimes be quite hard to see what I'm doing, and it's another reason why the mirror comes in so handy. For those of you who are curious, all of these trimmings that come off these bowls are recyclable. I just slake them down in water, and eventually it turns into a slurry which I can dry out on plaster bats until it's a clay-like consistency once again. So after a day or two trimming bowls, I always end up with a huge amount of reclaim to get through, as there's just so many trimmings. And that's the smallest bowl finished. Let's just quickly weigh it to see how much was removed. So about 101 grams in total. These things really do weigh nothing at all at this stage, and even less so once all the moisture has left them and they're bone dry. But it's necessary, as the glazes on my bowls go on so thickly. If they were heavy already, with the addition of thick glaze, they'd end up incredibly hefty. And here's one of many nestling sets. And what an enjoyable few days of trimming. I can't tell you how much I love these new tools, and rest assured, you'll be seeing a lot of them in the future. I should add a quick note that Phil Bison's shop isn't always open. You can find it on Etsy, and I'll leave a link down in the description below. He tends to open his shop for a couple of days, and then closes it again to fulfil all the orders he received. Anyway, I can't recommend them enough. Thanks so much for watching as always, 
and I'll leave you with some pure, unadulterated, trimming satisfaction for the end of this week's video.